economics that is still being taught in today's universities is based on theories drawn out in the textbooks of 1950 and they're based on ideas from the 1850s. They are centuries out of date. So rather than trying to walk away from it, I think we have to walk back towards it, but flip it on its head and start economics with the values that we know matter today, like human well-being and planetary integrity. And then we can ask what kind of economic thinking is actually fit for this century. De Engelse econoom Kate Rayworth ziet zichzelf als een afvallige in haar vakgebied. Want binnen de economische wetenschap is het overheersende idee dat de economie permanent moet groeien. Dat is volgens Rayworth een denkfout. Zij heeft daarom een nieuw economisch model ontwikkeld. De donut. Een kompas voor de economie van de 21ste eeuw. Volgens Rayworth, die ook wel de nieuwe Keynes wordt genoemd... ondermijnt het streven naar permanente groei uiteindelijk ons welzijn. My children, I have eight-year-old twins, they're growing taller and taller every year. It's wonderful. The flowers and trees in my garden grow. But look to all these things in nature. They grow and then they mature and they come to thrive. We seem to be stuck in economies that have this never-ending growth, never growing up. So we need to shift from this ideology of never-ending growth to seeing it as a healthy phase into which we mature. Kate Rayworth reageert in deze uitzending op voorbeelden die haar nieuwe economische model inzichtelijk maken. Dit is Tegenlicht. Welkom bij de strijd tegen oneindige groei. In de waag in Amsterdam werden ooit lijken ontleed. Hier ontstond dit schilderij van Rembrandt van Rijn. Een belangrijk beeld voor Kate Rayworth. Hiermee begint haar verhaal over ons beperkte idee van de economie en wat we kunnen leren van Rembrandt's anatomische les. This is a fantastic painting. Even though it was painted 400 years ago, it tells us so much about the discovery we're going on today. Right? 400 years ago in this very room, these men met to explore what it is about the human body that tips us from life to death. So how long can you go without blood running through your veins? How long can you go without breathing? How high can our body temperature get before we die? How long can we go without water? So the story of human medicine has been a story of understanding the systems on which our bodily health depends and how much pressure we can put on them before we tip ourselves from life to death. But surgery is not your trade, right? Oh no, because this is about the human body. What I'm fascinated by is the rewriting of economics to make it fit for the 21st century. And that has to start with understanding the planetary body on which we depend, this extraordinary living Earth. And now we must ask these very same questions. What are the critical functions of this planet that keep it in the extraordinary, stable, benevolent state to humanity that it's been in for the last 11,000 years? And how do those systems interact? How much pressure can we put on any one of them before we tip our planetary home out of kilter and cause a collapse that we don't want to see? Wat kan ons planetaire lichaam aan? 11.000 jaar lang hebben we er niet over hoeven nadenken. We overladen de aarde met ons afval. En het kost ons moeite in te zien dat we dat niet voortdurend kunnen blijven doen. Sinds het aantrekken van de economische groei zijn we zo blij dat we weer kunnen produceren en consumeren. Maar dat herstel van onze economie is misschien juist de kern van het probleem. That's the hidden view of today's global economy. Everything that we want comes gift wrapped with a ribbon on a beautiful plate. We only want to see the inputs and this shows us the outputs that we can't avoid. And it's so clear when you see it from that perspective that this is what has to change. But the economies have recovered. We can go shopping again. 
every time we go shopping and buy a new little gift wrap gift, more waste and pollution goes on the end of that chain. And if we don't, like Rembrandt, understand the planetary body on which we depend and understand the living systems on which we depend, we are oblivious to the endless damage that we're pouring out onto this living Earth. But everybody's happy. Purchasing power is back again. You know as well as I that everybody is not happy. Our economies are more unequal today than they have been in 30 years. There's deep division in society as a result of it. Xenophobia kicking in. But also people are more and more aware that the climate's changing. In fact, it's breaking down. That people worldwide are experiencing hurricanes, drought, sea level rise. That was never in the newspapers 30 years ago. So people, I think, are deeply ill at ease. And ironically, sometimes that means they choose to go shopping to get away from it. Terwijl we onszelf in slaap sussen met onze koopkracht, heeft de economische groei de planetaire grenzen bereikt. We consumeren meer dan wij en de planeet aankunnen. We voeden de heersende economie, waarin groei niet mag stagneren en waarin stilstand achteruitgang betekent. This is GDP, gross domestic product or national income, over time. And the idea of success in the economy we have and we're trying to escape from is an ever rising line. More is always better. It goes up, up, up. Growth that never ends. So that's what everyone has in his mind, so yeah. to speak. When you hear politicians talking about the economy, they say we want smart growth or good growth, resilient growth, inclusive growth, green growth, clean growth, balanced growth. You can have anything you want so long as it's growth. Because this is the idea of what economic success looks like. It was first created in the 1930s when the, the measure of national income was first created for the US economy and then created for all economies. And the idea that unending growth is what we're pursuing has been structured financially, politically and socially into our minds and into our economies. So that this has been the overriding image and idea of what progress looks like. And yet it's leaving us falling far short on some of life's essentials. And what happens when the line's going down? Oh, well, that's obviously... What does that do to people? Well, when you have an economy that is dependent, demands and expects unending growth and it's not coming, of course it's a disaster. Of course a recession or a crash is an absolute disaster in people's lives. We lose jobs, we lose value from the economy. It's, it's you know, governments come rushing in and bail out the banks. So, of course, it's a disaster if the line goes down in an economy that depends upon it always going upwards. This is where we're trapped. And this is why we have to get out of this trap of unending growth. And where is it going, the line? Well, that's a jolly good question. It's, it, it, on a 3% growth rate a year on year, it goes, shoots up to infinity. But stand back and look at the best example we can learn from nature. Nothing in nature grows forever. Anything that tries to grow forever destroys the host on which it depends. In our own bodies, we call it a cancer. So anything in nature actually grows and then comes to thrive. I can draw that on top of here. It grows, but instead nature eventually comes to thrive. That is a very different direction for an economy. Could we create economies that don't have to grow forever, whether or not they make us thrive, but instead grow until they make us thrive, whether or not they grow further? That's the transformation I think this century demands we make. Maar zelfs als de economie volgroeid is, zoeken we naar nog meer groei. Ook al leidt dat tot olierampen zoals die van BP in de Golf van Mexico in 2010. Een van de grootste ooit. 130 liters per second gush from a leak 1500 meters below the surface. 400,000 liters per hour. BP estimates that 4.7 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf. It claims that a quarter has been recovered by emergency platforms. Only a small fraction is skimmed from the surface. The greatest concern is that the crude will reach the mainland less than 80 kilometers away. Oil is actually one of the secret reasons why the 20th century economy could grow and grow fueled by this extraordinary fossil fuel, often not recognized by economists at all. So 
The gift that oil gave to humanity was endless growth. BP and the U.S. Coast Guard agree to spray a chemical dispersant on an unprecedented scale. The chemical dispersant is called Corexit, as in corrects it. More than four million liters of Corexit are deployed, according to official numbers. The petroleum industry has come to like dispersants. Simply spray them onto the surface, and the oil seems to disappear. This is how Corexit works. The combination of chemicals breaks the oil down into tiny globules that sink below the surface and are suspended in the water. That makes the oil invisible to the naked eye. But it's still there. It has just been distributed throughout the water column. So we can have accidents for sure, but what drives the increasing weight of accidents, say, in the oil industry? At the heart of it is the desire for growth, the push for increased profits, the demand from the financial system that wants to see more profits in the oil industry, that pushes them to dig ever deeper, to drill under the sea, to take more risky investments. It all connects. And this desire for growth sometimes is seen, well, you know, we can grow now and we'll clean up later. We might have an accident, but we can clean it up. We can push over planetary boundaries and come back in when we can afford to. This doesn't work. We cannot grow now and clean up later. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense and it pushes us into a danger zone from which we cannot afford to go and which we cannot afford to come back. There are communities all over the world in which carbon emissions are incredibly low. They have had almost nothing to do with the fossil fuel economy. They are at the front line of bearing the impacts of climate change. They are seeing their islands literally sinking under the sea. And at the same time, the salt water is destroying their fresh water sources. What should economies be aimed at? OK, let's pull back from what students are taught in universities, what is debated in national parliaments and discussed in the media. Let's leave aside this old idea of growth because we need a much bigger, richer, new imagination of what human progress looks like. And silly though it sounds, I think the new shape of progress is not an ever-rising line. It's actually a donut. Let me show you. So, here is the donut. And in the place in the middle, that's a place where people are falling short on life's essentials where people don't have the food, water, healthcare, income, political voice, gender equality, and the other essentials that every human being has a claim to, to lead a life of dignity and community and opportunity. So we want to get everybody in the world out of this space of shortfall and over the social foundation into the donut itself. So the middle is the human rights, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. All these shortfalls here come from decades of claiming the right of every person, starting in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, written into national law around the world. So we want to get everybody out of that space of shortfall to meet the rights and needs of all. But, and it's a big but, we cannot at the same time overshoot our pressure on this extraordinary living planet. We can't go over the ecological ceiling because there we start to put so much pressure on the critical life-supporting systems of this planet that we start to kick our planet out of kilter. Just as we saw in Rembrandt's painting, that dead body because the life-giving systems no longer work. So we start to cause climate breakdown, ocean acidification, massive biodiversity loss. Uh, we cause air pollution, chemical pollution. This diagram belongs to our generation. It's our challenge, and we need a new economic mindset if we're going to have a half a chance of taking it on. 
Maar die nieuwe economische manier van denken moet van ver komen. In de kledingindustrie zijn mensenrechten geen vanzelfsprekendheid. Hier leven en werken mensen aan de binnenkant van het donutmodel. In de onthullende, grotendeels met verborgen camera gedraaide documentaire China Blue... over het leven van fabrieksarbeiders in de fabrieken waar onze jeans worden gemaakt... zien we wat de industrie ons niet wil laten zien. Bijvoorbeeld de onderhandelingen om de prijs zo laag mogelijk te krijgen. Nou, mijn grote probleem is de delivery. Want ik weet van tevoren... You need to be near four dollars. Be honest with you. Yeah. Honestly, Frank. Uh, four dollars. I I Okay. 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 That film is fantastically powerful for making visible the pressures that go all the way down the supply chain. Because we see the factory manager in this tough negotiation with the buyer from the UK. And he's saying, comes away saying, we earn less profit than they do. And he's trying to cut the prices. He's being pushed by the UK buyer on price, on delivery deadlines. He'd be pushed, I'm sure, on flexibility. If they wanted to cancel the order, then we cancel the order. This is what buyers from high-income countries do in the brands, pushing the pressure down the supply chain. So throughout the fashion chain, which I've studied in some detail when I work at Oxfam, talking with exactly these people throughout the chain, you have this sense of the pressure being pushed down. Why? Because at the top end are the brands who also are under pressure. They're competing with each other and they're competing to sell more to consumers every season to make the season shorter. You've got to buy new shoes. You need this season's clothing. It comes back to this consumerist propaganda. You can't deny people to go shopping. Oh, I'm not denying people to go shopping, but think about what actually gives you well-being. It's actually usually not shopping. It's connection, belonging, respect, creativity, these we don't get in the shops. The advertisements tell us if you drink this fizzy drink, you'll have friends. If you wear this new jacket, you'll look cool. Actually, when, when research shows that when people talk about when they feel most alive, it's when they're connecting with their friends, they're doing something that's creative, they're learning something new, they're part of a community, they feel valued. It's connection with others, but there's nobody advertising that. So it's a race to the bottom, Th uh, through the bottom. There is a real race to the bottom, and it's through driven It's through the bottom. It's driven through the whole supply chain, pushing the costs and risks of global business in the name of lean manufacturing. That's what it gets called, because it's lean at the level of the shop. We only have in stock the products we want. We renew them as soon as we want. We're very flexibly responding to this consumer walking through the shop door. 
pushing it all down invisibly to the other side of the world. Aan die andere kant van de wereld wordt de flexibiliteit van de consument op haar wenken bediend. In lange ploegendiensten zijn werknemers overgeleverd aan een absoluut minimumloon en erbarmelijke arbeidsomstandigheden. Adam Smith knew all about this. It's not often you get to see the human drudgery behind the global fashion industry. But what we can see in this film is something that Adam Smith spotted centuries ago when he visited factories making pins in the UK. Because he saw that the division of labour separating a, a production process up into tiny tasks was brilliant for increasing human productivity, but he worried, in his very words, he worried about the drudgery and what it would do to the minds of these people. This young man, we see his job is merely to keep his finger on the cloth so that it runs straight. He's exhausted, he's probably been working for 24 hours straight. What is it doing to his mind, to his life? Could this young man not be doing something more creative in the world? I have no doubt he could but he's probably had no school education. His health is probably run down from working in the factory. They're earning $3 a shift from working here. This represents deep exploitation of people who have almost no other alternatives in life. And it extracts from them just as it extracts from the earth. That's exactly the kind of economy we want to get rid of, because it's exploiting people's deprivation and expecting them to take care of other people's overshoot. We have to turn that around. And who should take the initiative? Every smart person who begins to understand that this is what we depend upon. Whether you are the CEO of a company, fantastic, turn it around. If you're a politician, fantastic, now start speaking to this new reality. If you're a citizen, fantastic, get active in your community, sort out the waste and distribution in your own house. 
it has to happen everywhere. There's no waiting for some super being to lead us. And the real, the real wonderful thing about it is that people everywhere in all of these positions are indeed starting to make this transformation and showing it's not just possible, it's happening. What if we transformed waste into gold? What if we move to the circular economy? In the circular economy, products at the end of their lives are still thought of as resources and injected back into the manufacturing circuit. Goods are reused, refurbished or dismantled and recycled in a continuous circle. It's the circular economy. Let's apply the principle to jeans, for example, the most famous trousers in the world. We're in Amsterdam. In this boutique, instead of buying jeans, you rent them. At the end of the lease, the jeans are exchanged for a new pair and are completely recycled. When the jeans reach the end of their useful life, they are shredded. This precious material then heads for Italy, where it will be turned back into jeans. So we can see the beginnings of a circular economy emerging, just with one product there, just with the jeans. And it's still going to face challenges, they've still got to merge it with new cotton. It's being produced in Europe. This mustn't be taken to think that we've got to leave behind an old economy in Africa and Asia and bring a new economy to Europe. This new economy must be created within regions so that you'd see this kind of manufacturing happening all over the world. Mud jeans sells 50,000 a year. Worldwide, there are three billion pairs of jeans sold every year. So it's a tiny drop in a big ocean. Every transformation begins with tiny drops. This is the seeds of a new economy that's coming through. We can see it already today, whether it's in a pair of jeans or in a phone or in the food we eat, it's beginning to come through. Yes, the old economic production system is still dominant, but once we start to see the new way coming through and understand the design principles on which it's based, we can be part of building that. Take your money and your spending and your investments away from the old, degenerative, divisive economy. Put your consumer spending, your savings, your investment, your passion, your career into the new, generative, distributive economy. It's a continual process, but we need to see rapidly an end to, for example, single-use plastics. Right? Our children will look back to us and say, is it really true that you would take a plastic cup, drink from it once, and then just stick it in a landfill. Did you really do that? It will seem incomprehensible to them. So we need to immediately start putting in place legislation that says in five or 10 years time, there will be no single use plastic. At first, companies will lobby and protest. Once they realize this is happening, they'll just get on and innovate and make it work. Spullen weggooien, dat was vroeger. Onze kinderen beginnen op te groeien met afval dat weer een grondstof is. En hier hebben we dan een partij mobieltjes. Wij gaan deze mobieltjes binnennemen uh, om de edele metalen uit terug te winnen. Het goud, zoals je hier kunt zien, een beetje goudkleurig, de goudcontacten, vergulde contacten. Dat goud gaat teruggewonnen worden. Daarnaast uh, zeker ook zilver, palladium, koper, uh, lood, nikkel, tin, antimoon. Dat zijn allemaal elementen die we hier kunnen terugwinnen. In, in de natuur, om het zo te zeggen, komen palladium en, en goud bijna niet samen in mijnbouwproducten. Maar hier heb je ze samen in één toestel zitten. Dus je hebt hier een, 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 een rijke mijn. Een aantal jaren geleden, toen de Olympische Winterspelen waren in Vancouver, uh, toen hebben wij, of waren wij een van de voorleveranciers van het goud en het zilver, onder andere om de medailles van te maken. Het was ook materiaal wat ons werd aangeleverd onder de vorm van printplaten door een Canadese leverancier. We hebben de printplaten verwerkt, gerecycleerd, het goud eruit gehaald en dan het goud geleverd aan de Canadian Mint, die het gebruikt heeft, onder andere het gerecycleerd goud van ons, om er de medailles mee te maken. Dat een aantal van het goud wat wij hier toen gerecupereerd hebben, dat het nu uiteindelijk in Nederland ligt, want de Nederlanders zijn altijd goed op de winterspelen, veel beter dan de Belgen. Dus uh, jullie schaatskampioenen zullen zeker een aantal gouden en zilveren medailles hebben teruggebracht naar Nederland, waarvan het goud uiteindelijk of het zilver hier in Hoboken gemaakt is bij Umicore. I love the idea that gold recovered from mobile phones is now in Olympic medals. That's a beautiful example of the idea actually that we never run out of things. 
once we actually set our minds to it, we can reuse these resources again and again and again. What we need are the economic institutions, the financing, the regulations, the markets that actually enable this to happen. Maar de werkelijkheid is weer barstig. Bij de productie van de Fairphone, een mobiele telefoon die gebruik maakt van duurzame materialen en ervoor zorgt dat de arbeiders tijdens het productieproces niet geëxporteerd worden, ervaart ontwerper en directeur Bas van Abel de ethische grenzen van ons huidige economische systeem. Hij wilde als ontwerper zien wat er komt kijken bij het maken van een telefoon en startte om die reden een bedrijf. Het maken van een telefoon was om in de systemen te komen. Als jij alleen maar een telefoon maakt in je achtertuin en zegt van kijk, ik heb hem gemaakt en het is gelukt. Nou, dan ben ik misschien twee, driehonderd jaar bezig. Als we wat ouder worden, dan gaat dat lukken. Um, maar dan is het een kunstobject en dan zet je het ergens neer in een museum en zeg je kijk wel dat het kan. En het is onbetaalbaar, het gaat nooit lukken, het is heel symbolisch. Maar ik wil het economische systeem gaan bevragen. Dus dat betekent dat je gewoon, een, ja, je moet ook een bedrijf opzetten. Er moet een, een commerciële gedachte achter zitten. Dus ik wilde echt in het midden in die economie gaan zitten. Op het moment dat je, dat je dat bedrijf bent en het moet gaan doen en het product moet gaan maken, dan verandert alles. Want je zit, je loopt tegen alle shit aan waar elk bedrijf tegenaan loopt in die economische keten. En iedereen en alles denkt korte termijn en geld. Kijk, wat, wat, wat heel vreemd is, dat als je zo vol met passie en... en en zo intens bezig bent met iets, met het maken van iets... dat je jezelf zo ongelooflijk kwijt kan raken ook, omdat je, je wil dat het slaagt. En dus je bent daar constant mee bezig, het moet gewoon slagen. Maar je bent eigenlijk iets aan het bouwen wat je bijna niet meer in de hand kan houden. En voordat je het door hebt, ben je iets aan het creëren wat, ja, waar je eigenlijk helemaal niet meer achter staat. En dus je bent er bijna niet meer bezig met... Uh, met ja, waar, wat is de missie, wat is, waar doen we het voor? Nee, je bent keihard bezig om die, om, om die ondernemer die steeds meer het groeien is. En dan heb je, heb je ineens heb je, heb je 100.000 klanten, dan heb je een bedrijf wat, wat, wat 10, 10, 20 miljoen omzet maakt. Je hebt de verantwoordelijkheden voor het personeel, er zijn problemen met het product. Je, je bent alleen nog maar met geld bezig en overleven. En ja, dan vraag je je wel af, waar ben ik begonnen? Wat was de dag dat je dacht, ik ben geen designer meer, ik ben nu een ondernemer? Hey, heb ik... <laughs> ja, toen ik, uh, toen ik bij de crisisdienst van de GGZ belandde. Dat, dat, toen kwam pas het besef. Ja. Well, that video captures so beautifully the tension of someone who is trying to create this transformative economy and setting out almost alone and yet is confronted by the growth economy. And it's having to try and create a space in between that. How do I live out the values? How do I create a smartphone that pays decent wages, that respects the health of the, of the workers and their right to organize and within the means of the planet And yet, I'm having to do it in a cutthroat global market that's driven by short-termism, that's driven by money. You could feel it in his experience. But the real challenge, I think, the reason why he's facing that tension is because he's doing it alone. He's leading in trying to make this fair phone. Let me show you. Let me take these hose pipes. Okay, so the idea is to turn this into a circular economy, right? So one mobile phone company, its products will be used and then should be returned to the company to be reused again and again. That's what he's trying to do because he's doing it alone at the moment. But what if we have another company that says, well, we're going to do the same thing with our phones, right? We're going to also create a circular economy. So send your fair phone back to us, send your Samsung or your Apple or whatever products back to us. We could end up with thousands of these individual little loops. Now, if nature looked at us, she'd think it was cute, but she'd laugh because nature would never do this. Nature doesn't turn a parrot into a parrot and a daffodil into a daffodil. Nature works as an ecosystem, right? We're going to have, as Western consumers, own around 10,000 products each. There's no way people are going to return every single one back to the manufacturer. 
Where we need to go, we need an ecosystem, right? Here is an ecosystem of design. You can imagine a company, one of these little red nodes throughout here, but they're an ecosystem reusing resources in a network of industry so that the waste from any one mobile phone company can be picked up by anybody, they can see what that waste was, and it can be fed into this resource. Now, they can still be competing at the level of, is this the best phone? Is it smart? What functions does it have? But they are collaborating in a network of resources. Because it, that's in their advantage. It's going to be to everybody's advantage because the cost of those materials is going to come right down. Everybody will have access to reusing these resources that we're not running out of. We have to make them available again and again and again in this ecosystem. This is how nature works. And in this ecosystem, governments should work together with corporations, with consumers, with... The role of the government is huge to set the regulation. So on what kind of polymers are we going to use? What basic materials? And of course, that has to be done together with industry. What are the best ones to focus on? creating uh, obligations on companies to make that data available, to create the structure so that this ecosystem begins to exist, so that there is indeed a connection that waste from any one process is not seen as waste anymore. It becomes food for the next. We have dus meer regulering nodig. Maar hoe doen we dat in een gedereguleerde wereld? Hoe moeten overheden hun rol weer zien te vergroten? Moeten ze bedrijven dwingen om circulair te gaan produceren? Zoals bijvoorbeeld China dat van hoger hand doet? Well, one thing that we see going on in China, the government of China says they want to create an ecological civilization. Now, the government of China says different things with different hands, but on one hand it's saying ecological civilization and is, for example, currently investing $360 billion dollars between 2016 and 2020 in installing solar energy capacity. That's going to be a huge upswing for GDP as it goes in, but once that capacity is in, it's not going to contribute to rising GDP. This is an example of the flexibility we need to see in the future of GDP. But governments that have that control of regulation can rapidly start moving in this direction. It just shows that it's in the possibility of every government to say we're going to switch out of coal and gas into green energy. We're going to create a circular economy. We need to bring back regulation. It might be being led with clarity from China. What it shows, I think, is that many Western governments have shrunk the role of the state have almost become self-hating about the role of the state. It needs to come back. As Mariana Mazzucato will talk about, the role of the state is essential in driving that long-term vision, in investing and in sharing in the returns that come from a distributive and regenerative future. Denemarken is zo'n land dat door middel van het Danish Growth Fund investeert in startende bedrijven. We have invested uh, since the inception of, uh, of the Danish Growth Fund uh, approximately 2 billion euros in, in some 6,000 companies. And, and we expect to do some three to 400 million euros this year in eight, 900 companies. Het Fonds is een grote aanjager van de innovatie in Denemarken. Een van de bedrijven waar het met succes in investeerde was het bedrijf Universal Robots. It's a new kind of robot, so it's more a robot which is supposed to be a tool for people to use rather than this big machine behind a fence that steals people's jobs. So let's say we want the robot to do some uh, simple motion. So let's say I want it to start here. Mm -hmm. Then I want it to go down here. And then I want it to turn like this and now I'm done with the program so now I can just press play and now the robot is going through these points I just programmed and now the robot can run for four years five years like this so you're done I guess we invested first time in, in eight um, um, an amount of um, two million euros the company grew in size the critical phase was to get to a sales volume where the Numbers were actually so you make black numbers on the bottom, not red numbers anymore. Yeah. And uh, that happened at around 20 robots per month. 
And then we divested uh, the company here in, in this spring. We, we got uh, our money back 50 times on the cash deal alone. So, um, uh, so we got back uh, some 100 million euros uh, on the cash deal and then on top of this comes an earn out. Yeah, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. So we can begin by asking, if you have capital, where do you want that capital invested? Let's go back to the original idea of the word investing, putting it committedly into some, something that you want to see grow in the future. So what do you want to see grow in the future? Do you want to see exploitative labour and oil spills? Or do you want to see actually growing an energy system that can enable humanity to thrive? Do you want to see growing decent labour around the world? Every investor has a choice of where to put that money. And those choices are becoming more and more clear as we have ethical banks and ethical investment funds. Those choices are being laid out for us. So it's too easy to say we don't know, we haven't seen down the supply chain. We can see if we choose to look, and then we can choose to do something differently with our investments and with the companies we build and with the supply chains that we create. There are options out there, which is essential because then we can begin to create a new economy. The total distance we cover each year using fossil fuels is just over 9.5 trillion kilometers. One light year. Our goal is to let people travel the same distance using only the power of nature before the year 2035. We set out to develop a car that directly uses nature's biggest source of energy, the sun. It is here today, tomorrow, and it will be here forever. As pioneers in this field, we have been building prototypes for years, with great success. And now, it's time for the giant leap. Traveling the distance of a light year, using only solar energy. That is our mission. So the message of this video is really clear to me that the challenge we face, the barrier we face, is not designing technologies that can run on sunlight. They exist, and they're being improved at an extraordinary pace. The challenge and the barrier is designing government regulation that actually enables this to happen. Designing finance that isn't so short-termist and extractive that it won't fund this. We need finance that's long-term investing in regenerative design that it will fund this. So it's not the technologies that we don't have, it's the economics. It's the government regulation, the market incentives, the financial systems, the business models that will actually unleash the possibilities that designers already know how to create. That's why economics is suddenly so exciting. How do we unleash these regenerative, cyclical, distributive designs that people around the world are already making happen in the face of the old economy? They're putting their lives and their stress and their own investments on the line. We need to align the whole economy the global economy with that vision, because only that vision of regenerative and distributive design is going to bring us inside the donut, is going to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. So there's woman Vanessa, by wonderful irony, she works for a airline company. Obviously, when she gets to these exotic destinations, she kite surfs, and I think kite surf is a lot smarter for the new economy than flying. Because a kite surfer works with the waves of the regenerative economy and the wind of the distributive economy. And as you can see, to balance between them, she's pulling up and down on this bar. And it's that black bar in the middle that allows her to balance between the winds and the waves. And I think this is the best analogy for the future of GDP. Our economy should be becoming regenerative, working with those waves, and distributive, working with the wind. And GDP, merely the value in goods and services bought and sold, it needs to be able to go up and down in response to that far bigger mission of regenerative and distributive design for a 21st century economy. Look, she's smiling, you see, it's fun. It might not be easy, but it's fun. <laughs>